Hey, welcome everyone to our third webinar of the new series. My name is Katie and I will be your host and moderator on behalf of the Wildflower Society of Western Australia. Before we begin tonight, the, the Society would like to pay our respects and acknowledge the traditional custodians where we are hosting and recording this webinar today, the Woodjuk people of the Noongar Nation, as well as the traditional custodians of the various lands where everyone is joining us from. The presentation today will go for about 45 minutes following with some Q&A. You can send your questions through just in the chat box or you can raise your hand in the toolbar and ask yourself. Um, as well, if anyone does happen to come into any issues or difficulties and would like some help, please don't hesitate to contact the email address, address that's listed on the events page on the Society's website so we can hopefully sort it out. For this month's webinar, we are delighted to be joined by our guest speaker, Dr. Philip Zilstra, Adjunct Associate Professor from the School of Molecular and Life Sciences at Curtin University from Sydney, where we will learn about the work Dr. Zilstra conducts to understand the relationship and mechanics of fire and our natural ecosystems and how it has drastically changed since European colonisation. Dr. Zilstra will explain that the future holds two options. Let our current methods remain unchanged, leading us to burn out in a blaze of destruction, or follow the pathway of reconciliation, which provides maximizing biodiversity, carbon storage, and the welfare of our own species. So I will let everyone get to the reason we're here tonight, and I'll hand you over to Philip. Thanks so much, Katie. Um... Yeah, and thanks everybody for, for turning up tonight. Um, yeah, I'm not in WA at the moment. I'm on Durable Country in New South Wales, and uh, yeah, it's good to be here. So I'll I'll just bring up the presentation. Okay, so. The background we're looking at there is a from a prescribed burn I conducted back when I worked in fire management um, in New South Wales. Now, I'll just I'm just going to move things around here a little bit because I've got uh, I've got my text being blocked on the screen. <laughs> um, um, there's a, a quote here from Stephen Pine, who is is considered by many to be the world's foremost um, fire historian, and he said that during the 1950s, Australians formalised their long-standing practice of burning off into a systematic program. Instead of the Aboriginal fire stick, A.G. MacArthur, chief fire researcher and later director of Australia's Forestry and Timber Bureau, exalted, we now use aircraft dropping incendiary capsules. So this is the this is the basis of uh, what I call the, the the central fire myth in Australia that we replaced uh, Aboriginal burning with burning uh, through prescribed burning, generally burning ignited from aircraft. And I suggest that one doesn't really resemble the other in any real way. Now. Back when I worked on fire management in the snowies, um, I remember one morning, winter's morning, driving in to work. It's a, it's quite a long drive. It was a typical winter's morning, about a minus eight frost out on the grasslands. Everything was white. Um, I saw a hitchhiker on the side of the road and um, went to pick him up. Uh, he hopped in the car and the first thing he did was um, said, um, would you mind turning the heater off, please? Um, I've got burns and um, and it hurts them. And I said, yeah, sure. Um, are you OK? And he said, yeah, I got these burns when the fairies took me into the future and I saw global nuclear war. So they're radiation burns. Now, we had a long drive ahead of us. And um, and it was it was, I got to say, I enjoyed the drive. He um, he added to the rich tapestry of life for me, and uh, we we had some some interesting discussions. But I have a principle, I suppose, that when somebody does something like that, when they just make a statement, 
that uh, it's, it's just given as a, as a passing statement with no justification, but it's something quite extraordinary that you would expect to be backed up, and it's not. I'm then careful with that person that I don't use them as my reference point that I don't use them as a primary source of information. I, I don't just take everything that they tell me on trust. And I feel the same way when I read this quote, particularly with this little throwaway line at the end. Um, where we're told that lasers have now replaced capsules. Now, in all the time that I worked in fire management, I saw plenty of aircraft dropping capsules. I was working with the drip torch at the time when I took this photo. We had uh, quad bikes riding around the edges of prescribed burns, firing out capsules um, with incendiary launches fixed to the back of them. The boss was trying to wangle things to get a vehicle-mounted flamethrower attached to um, to one of the trucks so that they could circle around blocks and, and burn faster. The whole thing was about burning as fast as possible, but never once does anybody did anybody ever use lasers. We don't use lasers to like prescribe burns. We don't have them on planes. We don't have space lasers. So where did Stephen Pine get this idea from? He was talking to CSIRO people he was going straight to the horse's mouth. He could have checked that information. And so what that means to me is that um, I'm now careful with other information. And I think we need to be careful with other information that we get from this source. And consider that with these next quotes. He tells us that it is extraordinary that on this, the hottest and driest of the vegetated continents, its indigenes, nomads all, habitually walked around with flaming firebrands that dribbled embers everywhere. I think he's picturing drip torches, not fire sticks. And that required constant rekindling by igniting forest litter and grassy tussocks. Carry a gun and you'll shoot it. Carry a rock and you'll throw it. Carry a fire stick and you'll set fire to the landscape around you. Yet the very extensiveness of Aboriginal burning, which kept fuels light, ensured against horrific wildfires. Now, when I was a kid, uh, if I was lighting candles on a birthday cake, what I'd do is I'd, I'd get one burning candle and I'd use that to light the other candles next to it. What I never did was get that burning candle and go and set the curtains on fire and carry the other candles over and then light those candles off the burning curtains. I didn't need to do that. I had a burning candle in my hand. And it makes me wonder how you have these First Nation cultures for 65,000 years and none of them yet worked out that you could just light another fire stick from the one that you're holding. Stephen Pine's telling us that they didn't do that, that they actually had to set fire to forest litter and grassy tussocks they had to burn the bush that they're living in it's like lighting the curtains to light up the next next candles why did he think they needed to do that he says carry a gun and you'll shoot it. i know a lot of farmers who drive around with a gun in the back of the in back of the ute um you know they do it all the time and never once have i seen one of them just pull over and shoot a sheep because he's carrying a gun he carries the gun and he might not use it for a year until there's something that comes up where there is an injured animal or something like that that, that needs the gun. He's not driven by compulsion. Aboriginal people weren't carrying around these fire sticks thinking, oh, I've got to burn something. That's, that's, a, that's a whole different mental illness. That's, you don't survive 65,000 years without working out how to light one fire stick from another and without having the self-control to not just set fire to things wherever you are. And yet, here we are with this story from the world's foremost fire historian telling us that this is what happened. Now, like my friend that I picked up in the car, 
I don't believe that fairies took him to the future to see a nuclear war. I also don't believe that fairies took Stephen Pye into the past to get this information. This is guesswork. And the reason he's come up with this, the reason he has given us this description of people who can have a culture that lasts 65,000 years without learning these most basic things is because he needs them to have burnt that massive area of country. It's the only way you can have burnt the hectares that fit the theory. Because you see, we used aircraft, we threw out incendiaries from aircraft, we had people literally jogging through the bush with drip torches. We had these trucks flying around the edges, firing incendiaries into the bush because we needed to get as many hectares burnt as we possibly could to meet the hectare target that had been set by the state. And yet every time there is a big fire, the answer is that the answer that we're told is that, well, we're not burning as much as Aboriginal people did in bare feet with fire sticks. Now, if you talk to somebody who conducts traditional burning, I've got you and mates on the New South Wales South Coast who the way they describe it is that they will um, they'll stop at one point, take the fire stick, light a point of the, of, on the ground on fire, and then they will watch that point to see whether the insects are moving faster than the flame. And if the flame is outpacing the insects, then they get a green branch and slow the flame down. That is not how you get hectares burnt. You don't burn big areas like that. This prescribed burn here was quite a small one. It was only maybe 500 hectares. Now, at the, at the pace that my UN mates burn country and others that I've spoken to from various other nations, um, that is many weeks of burning to get a few hundred hectares burnt like that. There are burns in WA, you know, regularly up on top of the, the Darling Escarpment up behind Perth there. You'll, there are burns there that are tens of thousands of hectares. Um, there is no comparison between the scale of burning. Now, how do we know then um, what sort of burning, what, what sort of evidence do we have of Aboriginal burning prior to um, colonisation? Well, one way we can do that is by looking at charcoal deposits. Um, charcoal deposits were, this is probably the best paper that I'm aware of. Um, Scott Mooney compiled a whole lot of deposits uh, at the time, it was believed that First Nations had been in Australia for about 40,000 years. We now know it's about 65,000. But what he did was he looked at this trend and he showed that, um, yes, the amount of charcoal in the soil, which is an indicator of the amount of fire, goes up and goes down and it roughly follows climatic trends. Um, and so we get we get this sort of long sequence over 40,000 years. Now, to give you an impression, this is where I was taught as a kid that ancient history began. Uh, this is where I was taught as a kid that Australia began. Um, so we're living in pretty recent history, and this 40,000-year history still doesn't cover Aboriginal um, occupation of this country. Now, when Captain Cook came to Australia, he came from a country where there was a lot of this sort of thing, came from Britain, where there were the moorlands. And the, the people that we call the settlers in Australia tended to be farmers that came out of this, this moorland country. Um, looks, looks beautiful to me. It reminds me of the Monero grasslands where I, I lived for a long time. Um, but the moors aren't naturally like that. The moors are like that because they have people doing this. Um, these people are burning heather. 
Now, they burn the heather for two reasons. Uh, firstly, if you burn it, you get fresh young heather growing and the fresh young heather attracts grouse and the grouse attract rich people with guns. Um, the second reason is that if you don't burn the heather, then what happens is you um, you get trees growing there because the moors weren't naturally heather and grassland. The moors used to be forests. This is what's called a disclimax state. Um, you are constantly disturbing this environment here, keeping it in a disturbed state by burning it as often as you can so that it doesn't um, succeed. Succession doesn't occur. It doesn't develop back into a forest. So during the early 1800s, a lot of these people who had uh, been living in these moors and who had been creating these moors and converting forests into more land and keeping forest out of that by burning it, these people moved to Australia and became the settlers here. And if you look to the right of this graph, here's what happened to charcoal deposits in the country. This is our fire hockey stick. Massive, massive increase in charcoal. Now, to me, that looks like a fairly clear story, but it's not a story that can be accepted readily. And it, you will find in many, many papers that refer to this, um, the answer given is not that there was a big increase in fire, but that there was actually a decrease. How can that be? Well, firstly, it needs to be that to fit the narrative because if we think back to what Stephen Pine said, it was this widespread burning that prevented catastrophic fires. The argument is that if you don't burn really frequently, you get this buildup of fuels which will give you catastrophic fires. So the argument here is that the reason we got this huge spike in charcoal is because of evidence that is not showing up in the charcoal. All we've got is this line. But we add to that this theory that by not burning the country as often as First Nations did, we allowed fuels to build up, and as a result, we got huge fires. Here's an example of how that plays out. This is um, a friend of mine, Richard Swain. He's a Wiradjuri man who has lived in the Snowies all his life. This is the Snowy River in the background. It's, it's, it's his country. He cares for this country deeply. He is a fierce defender of this country. He spends all of his, his spare time with the elders who, who speak for this land, and um, he knows the stories. As he's taken me around the Snowy River there, he, um, he will just pick up artefacts off the ground left and right. And it was an eerie feeling after a day of doing that. It was, it was something like um, walking into a house that was clearly abandoned, but still had table settings out on the table. There was just this sort of sense that there was a sudden disappearance of people who had been so thoroughly um, embedded in this landscape. It was a spooky kind of a feeling. Richard can point out uh, trees that you would walk straight past where the soil has washed away and the roots are raised above the ground because you've lost, um, you know, 30 centimetres of topsoil out of there. He can show you all of the different signs to show that the reason for this is that there's been a massive amount of burning in the last 150 years. And um, it's probably in the last 50 or so years that it's had greater protection from fire. And the country is very slowly recovering. But uh, he, he is, uh, I suppose, just determined to see that land protected. So he was particularly upset to hear about a study that had been conducted a little bit lower down on the Snowy River um, which looked at charcoal 
in that area and showed that here in the mid 60s there was a huge increase in charcoal that was the information that they had they also could see from pollen that there'd been a lot more woody plants coming into the area during that time um, the paper was called the curse of conservation and it argued that um, changes in land use legislation drove catastrophic bushfires and that those changes in land use legislation were a series of rules um, in environmental legislation that they said stopped fire. Now, there have been two responses to that that I'm aware of in the same journal, both pointing out that, well, actually, that legislation didn't cover fire at all. It didn't actually even mention fire. And secondly, we can know whether there were catastrophic bushfires since that time. We don't even need to look at the charcoal. We've got the mapped fire history. You don't you don't have a catastrophic fire happening without people knowing that it's happened. Otherwise, it's not catastrophic. Um, and all of those fires have been mapped in the area, and there were no big fires during that time. So why was there an increase in charcoal? Well, that's because the new legislation that came in said there needs to be prescribed burning. It brought in prescribed burning. Every one of those big spikes that you can see in the charcoal is because there was a big prescribed burn right down at the river and the charcoal washed into the area where they were measuring. Now, I'm not sure why the authors didn't look at that information to interpret their charcoal uh, measurements. What they did do, though, was speak to a single person, a, um, a forestry um, contractor from the area who told them that, yes, this legislation stopped them from burning and as a result there were massive fires, completely counter to all of the evidence. But that paper got picked up, got published and is widely quoted by people because it fits the narrative. The narrative is that the reason we have more fire now is that we don't burn as much as Aboriginal people did on foot with fire sticks. So another way we can look at what happened in the past is by looking at fire scars on trees. Um, there's not a lot of that information around because you need trees that predate invasion. Um, but there's a little bit in WA, we've got studies in the Carry and in the Jarrah. And what we found was that in the Carry forest, there was an almost complete absence of fire scars before 1850. They came in very commonly after 1850, but there were almost none before then. Prior to invasion, Jarrah forests had a fire scar on average 81 years apart within the decade of invasion following then, um, those fire scars moved to 17 years apart on average. If we look in Eastern Australia where the other uh, dendra chronological work has been done, we see again in the snowies um, that as we get to around 1840, 1850, there is a massive increase in the frequency of fire scarring. Again, fits exactly the same trend as the charcoal, a huge increase in fire at the point of invasion. Now, once again, if you read anything uh, that, that references this information, you will almost certainly hear it cited as evidence that there has been decreased burning. Now, again, there's no evidence of of that in this information. All we can see is the number of scars on the tree. The argument is that um, trees will only scar if there is high intensity fire. Now, each time you see that in a paper, if, if you are a scientist working in this field, I'd encourage you to have a look at um, where that information came from. Chances are you will find that it's cited from another paper, which is cited from another one, and that will all come back to this departmental report written in the 1980s. 
Now, this report looked at Jarrah Forest and it had five data points. Um, going from left to right, we have low to higher intensity fire and the black bars give us an indication of, of how much fire scarring there was. As you can see, the two intensities most likely to scar are the highest intensity and the lowest intensity. There's not a trend. It doesn't increase, doesn't decrease. It's just all over the place. And that's because the same study found that almost all of the variability was to do purely with the age of the trees and how thick the bark was. So how did we get from that to the story that only high-intensity fires scar trees? This line here explained it all. Fire intensity up to 600 kilowatts per metre was not a reliable measure of the level of severity of bowl damage. We're never told in the report why it wasn't a reliable measure. We're just told that it wasn't. And what that meant was ignore those three data points, keep those two data points. And when you do that, you've got an increasing trend. That's where our story comes from, that only high intensity fires can scar trees. That's it. In the Cary Forest, in that Rainer study, um, what they what, what he pointed out was that um, carry trees are all scarred by what we call low intensity prescribed burns. We can't seem to burn the carry in a way that doesn't scar it. Same with the snow gums in the graph. We can't seem to burn it in a way that doesn't scar the trees. These fires that don't scar trees, we haven't been able to achieve them yet. So the whole story that only high intensity fires scar trees and low intensity fires don't do it, there's no evidence behind it yet. So I suppose to 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 nail that down, we've got we've got all of the evidence telling us that there was a massive increase in charcoal and a massive increase in fire scarring all at the point of invasion, at the point that these people moved to Australia with a culture of burning forest to clear it, to create grazing land. So why do we persist with holding on to this story that Aboriginal people must have burnt more than we do now and that we must increase our amount of prescribed burning to catch up somehow? It all comes back to this argument about fuel load. So we really need to look at that and that's really the core of where my work has gone, is what actually drives fire? If we want to understand fuel load, we've actually got to go to North Carolina here. This is a photo from the Texas publication Garden and Gun. Um, this gentleman's looking at his plantation of longleaf pine trees. Longleaf pine are an important timber crop. He bought this land um, when it was a forest of oak, persimmon and hickory trees. And what happens is that um, straight after a major disturbance, you get trees like the longleaf pine that come in as early colonisers. But then over time, um, they are replaced by the broadleaf trees and when the broadleaf trees come in, they create a dark, shaded, moist forest that can't burn. He tried to burn it because he wanted the pine trees as a timber crop, but couldn't burn it. So he ended up poisoning the whole block and planting it out manually with longleaf pine trees. So the issue with longleaf pine has been that people need to keep burning it. It's like the moorlands. You have to burn the moors to keep the grouse coming so that people have got something to hunt and you've got grazing lands. And here you have to keep burning these forests to keep them in a disclimax state so that you don't get this dark forest come in that will stop fire from spreading. Um, so a lot of people um, through American modern American history have have been burning these forests and they wanted good guidelines on how to do it safely without damaging their timber crop. 
And so during the 1950s, um, George Byram developed this very famous equation for fire intensity. And it's it's quite simple and straightforward. Um, a, a certain type of fuel like pine needles have, they contain a certain number of calories or kilojoules of energy. Um, so if you multiply the weight of that fuel by the rate that it is spreading, that the rate the fire is spreading is the rate that the fuel is burning, then you get an energy output. Seems quite straightforward. Now, that was then brought into Australia in the early 1960s by Alan MacArthur, who we've heard about um, at the beginning of the talk. And MacArthur did a bit more work on this where he argued that we can, we can apply that work describing fire spread in pine needles to Australian forests because we have layers of leaf litter. And he presented this leaflet showing nine data points. Um, now, there's no information behind that. There's no actual data provided. There's no methodology. There's no analysis provided. Just his hand-drawn graph. So this came out as a, as a leaflet without peer review. Um, it's not something that we would normally accept as evidence today for something that affects life and death decisions. And in his defence, MacArthur never intended it that way. He effectively said that it was a back of the envelope calculation. Now, since that time, a lot of work has been done to examine how true it is. In the 1990s, um, Dr. Neil Burrows conducted uh, what's really the gold standard of tests for this sort of thing manipulative experiments. You keep everything else constant and you change only the fuel load and see if that makes a difference. And what he found was that it made no difference. The rate of spread of a fire actually has nothing to do with the fuel load. Now, those experiments uh, were manipulative, but they were largely ignored. Despite in any other field, that would have seen would have been seen as... Um, as the evidence that, no, we've got a bad theory, let's dispose of that one. But by the time Dr Burrows produced this work, uh, we already had a major industry developed around fire management using this approach of reducing fuel loads. So rather than saying, let's get rid of it, let's change, let's wise up, we brought in an, a much, much larger series of experiments called Project Vesta. Project Vesta, again, found exactly the same thing. If you're just burning leaf litter and um, near surface litter, which is the vast majority of the fuel load, you've only got a small, slow spreading flame. What gives you big flames is the understory. But the weight of fuel in the understory is not that much compared to the litter on the ground. Um, finally, um, Michael Story in Eastern Australia conducted a whole series of um, studies of different wildfires and compared wildfire spread in a huge range of conditions with the fuel loads of that time. And he said there was almost no linear relationship. Now, he's being very generous there. At the end, it says there was an R squared of 0 0.001. Now, in most fields, if you've got an R squared of about 0.4, it's seen as a weak relationship. This is 400 times weaker. So putting it bluntly, we know that doubling the fuel load doesn't double the rate of spread that MacArthur said. The argument here, MacArthur's argument put together with George Byram's argument is the basis for fuel reduction burning. Because what they say is that if you halve the fuel load, then remember fuel load times rate of spread gives you intensity. So halve the fuel load, then you've halved the intensity, but you're also halving rate of spread. So you're halving it again. It's a pretty strong argument for prescribed burning, except that we know that it's wrong. Again, this has been my main field is to look at that mechanistically I've developed a fire behavior model called FRAME, the fire research and modeling environment, um, where I've looked at how fire actually spreads from one leaf to the next up through the plants. 
again, I've I've shown that this does not hold up. There is no mathematical, physical argument for it, just as there is no empirical argument. But what about the intensity equation? That seemed fairly straightforward. Each fuel, eucalypt leaves, for example, contain a certain number of kilojoules. So the fuel load times the rate of spread gives you your intensity. Let's look at a worked example. Um, burning bulga grass trees is something that's that's carried out by a number of different councils in WA. Um, uh, the argument is that it can be done as a low intensity cool burn um, and that then stops a high intensity wildfire afterwards. How do you make it low intensity? Well, you, you're trying to reduce the fuel load, the weight. So all you've got to do is have a slow spreading fire. If you ignite an individual grass tree on fire, then you've actually got a zero rate of spread. Your rate of spread is zero. So you've got a zero intensity. That's how you get a low intensity fire in this area. It's quite easy to do. Now I looked at it from, um, from the perspective of this hollow that you can see in the photo above the grass tree, because in that hollow, there had been um, this fella here, Anguia, Western ringtail possum, they're a critically endangered species. Um, there was a, a population of them in this small reserve at the time. And I was concerned um, because there had been a prescribed burn carried out in this reserve. And here's what happens when you set uh, a bulgar grass tree on fire. You get a flame like this. The white lines there are the predictions from frame. Each, each line is a flame length and angle at, in one second intervals. And what that enables me to do is to work out what the air temperature is up at that hollow there and within the hollow. So if we look over time, we can see on the dotted line that the air temperature got to over 500 degrees there. But each of these successive lines is um, the temperature a little bit further into the wood because the wood is insulating the inside of the hollow. And the red line is the temperature inside the middle of the hollow where the possum is living. You can see that it's much cooler than the outside air, but it has crossed this line into this territory. And what that means is by crossing that line, the air in there is now so hot that it has actually burned the um, respiratory tracts of the possum and the possum will asphyx asphyxiate. Now, it looks like this particular uh, poor little fella didn't, um, stay in there long enough to asphyxiate. He panicked and tried to leave. And um, sorry for the photo, but this is how he ended up. 77% of this population of critically endangered possums were killed by this extremely low intensity fire. How can that be? Well, the equation works on paper, but that's all. That's the only place that it works. Because in reality, fire does not just spread across the ground. When you set a grass tree on fire, it spreads upwards through the tree as well. We've got a three-dimensional world. The fire intensity equation doesn't work, just as MacArthur's equation doesn't work. It's bad science. We know better than that stuff now. So where does this leave us why do i call this a war on the wild this is a statement from a, um, a review of reports on wildfires um, mega fires around the world and the authors have argued that mega fires are being fueled by over accumulated biomass that happens in undisturbed forests Think about that for a moment. What is biomass? Biomass, bio is life, mass is weight. It's the weight of all life. We don't include ourselves in that. It's the weight of all non-human life. The weight of all life that isn't us. Too much life that isn't human is a hazard. Undisturbed forests are a hazard, according 
to this thinking. So let's have a look at what's actually happening. There's the argument behind it. This is this is the crux of the issue. This is the argument is that biomass life that is not human is the issue. We have to reduce it. So how does the bush actually work? Now, some decades ago, Ray Specht, famous Australian ecologist, came up with this statement that disturbance may reduce the overstory cover, which will be compensated by an increase in understory cover. What that means is that if you take out tall plants, plants will regrow to take their place and they will regrow from the ground up. If you burn them, if you log them, you will get new growth the ground. And so we see this in Jarrah forests. Dr Burroughs looked at this as over time in Jarrah forests, you get this massive increase after fire in the understory cover and density. And that then self thins, peaks at around 22 years, self thins so that by around 50, 60 years time, the forest looks like this. It's now open again. That open forest has the same weight of understory biomass that a one-year-old forest has. The difference is that if you leave the 60-year-old forest um, without burning it, it stays open, possibly becomes even more open. If you leave the one-year-old forest uh, for, say, five years, this is what it looks like you get that massive increase in understory growth. This is the same site as the bottom photo, just five years after a low intensity fire. So what we get is this huge increase in understory. Now, again, um, nearly you know, about 80 years ago now, um, uh, Charles Lane Poole, uh, conservator of forests stated that the thickening up of our forests is entirely due to fire. The exclusion of fire will render them less susceptible to fire because it will get rid of an enormous amount of inflammable material. He was saying that because people around him were seeing forests that were still open like this bottom photo and they saw what happened when you burnt them, that it produced this dense understory. Now he's been ridiculed for that but we now see that he's quite right. That is what happens with the Jarrah understory there. We've seen evidence that it happens in Kerry Forest. There's certainly plenty of evidence happening in Eastern Australia. And it leads us to something else. And this is, this is um, where a lot of my work has gone. Um, this is the basics of how biomass affects fire behavior. So you, uh, um, I'm using uh, my mechanistic modeling here to um, to work this out, but it's actually quite intuitive. If you've got a small amount of fuel, you've got a small, slow flame. If you add plants, you've got more fuel and a bigger flame. Bigger plants will give you a bigger flame. But the plants that aren't burning, those taller trees there, they are still affecting the fire because they're slowing the wind speed beneath them. Even in the black summer fires in Eastern Australia three years ago, um, about 82% of the forest there wasn't crown fire. 82% of that area, those trees were slowing the wind speed beneath them and that slows the fire down, calms it down. So let's look back at Speck's principle in that context. If it's true that disturbance can reduce the overstory cover, which will be compensated by an increase in understory cover, then the opposite is also true. Maturation of the forest may replace the understory cover with an increase in overstory cover, meaning those small plants that came from the disturbance will grow into taller plants. And if those plants are tall enough that they don't ignite, then they too will slow the wind speed beneath them. So now you don't just have a small amount of fuel to burn. You've also got a large amount of what's called overstory shelter. The taller plants that slow the wind speed beneath them, slow the fire down. This is what's called ecological control theory. 
um, which we published earlier this year, and there's now been a, a focus on it in the leading global ecology journal, Trends in Ecology and Evolution. But it's not a new idea. I've just given it fancy names to make it sound smarter than it is. <laughs> uh, this is um, Dr. Wayne Webb and his son, Zach, speaking for their country in the Tingle. They've argued that the Tingle forests were never deliberately burnt. How can that be? It goes right against the argument of reducing fuel loads. But his argument is that it was necessary to keep it open. He wants to see fire kept out of this country. This is not just a theoretical thing, by the way. The, as we see, um, the biggest flames are produced when plants burn. We see that burning forest produces this dense understory regrowth. So we would expect to see then that that is that the biggest fires are happening where the forest is the most flammable, which is around that 22 year mark. I looked at DBCA mapped fire histories, West Australian mapped fire histories across the southwest there through the forests and together with two others. And what we found was exactly that trend. The forest is all burning around that area where the understory is most dense. And the reason it is most dense is purely because of prescribed burning. Prescribed burning is done to clear those forests, to create an open forest. But the reality of it is that two thirds of the forest is being maintained in this state of maximum flammability. Tingle forests are being maintained at the left-hand side of this graph there, where there is dense understory growth. And so when um, Uncle Wayne Webb talks about um, keeping fire out of the tingle, it's because he, he wants it kept, like the photo on the right-hand side, as an open forest, rather than with this dense regrowth that we see in the middle there. And it's not just tingle. It's happening all over the all over the place. We see this in so many different forests. I've got to try and wind up. Sorry, I'm going a little bit over time. So um, it comes back to a basic principle. Um, Stephen Pine said that in both America and Australia, indigenes and frontiersmen demanded access to fire without which lands were biologically locked up and unusable. What's he talking about there? Um, remember, the reason the longleaf pines were burnt was because they wanted a disclimax state. They wanted the timber value. The reason the moors were burnt was because they wanted a disclimax state. They wanted the grazing value and the grouse in that location. They wanted a disturbed landscape. The review of fires said that the problem from all of these different reports was that forests weren't disturbed enough. It brings us to a basic concept in ecology where there are two strategies for surviving in the landscape. We have a carrying capacity. A certain paddock can only hold so many sheep before you start getting starvation. You have one strategy that we call R strategists. I won't go into the reason why we have these names. Our strategists breed up really fast. They overshoot the carrying capacity. Then their starvation population collapses. It starts recovering and you get this oscillation there. These are, plant, these are things like weeds, rabbits, feral animals that take off and take over the landscape. The alternative is the K strategists who grow at a slower pace and they're in there for the long haul. Now, as humans, we have the option of being one or the other. Cultures that survived for 65,000 years are case strategists. Cultures that need things to be destroyed for us to survive, this is what we see from rabbits, from weeds, from, um, from feral animals. Um, they grow fast, they take over a landscape, the other species suffer. 
this is where we're at as a culture at the moment. And we have this driving our thinking about prescribed burning, this idea that the land is locked up biologically and it's unusable unless it's disturbed. But there are case strategists in that landscape. Quokkas, for example, this is what happens to quokka numbers if you leave the forest unburnt and allow it to recover. Um, if you were a case strategist, um, you know, with Andy people or, or uh, others living in that area, then you've got a food supply there. You may not be able to support the same high numbers as if you had intensive agriculture, but that's not what it was about because they were K strategists, not R strategists. And as K strategists, our First Nations were not interested in keeping the country in this state. They wanted to allow it to mature into this state. And so fire was used in this meticulous way where you would burn only the places that you needed. You didn't burn tens of thousands of hectares and allow it to turn into this dense regrowth. You burnt around your campsites, along pathways, um, you know, in, in specific locations where it was useful. So if we come back to this statement, this is the argument that we should not allow biomass, allow the lives of other species to accumulate. It is absolutely critical that we recognise this statement is wrong. We need biomass to accumulate. We need forests to mature. We need to facilitate forests to get into this state where we have the heaviest carbon storage on earth in this forest on the left, which is a, a Regnans forest. Um, if we disturb that, if we log it, if we burn it, we get this young regrowth that will carry a big fire. Um, I'll leave that there. This is um, uh, a story that I'm happy to tell later on if anybody's interested, but thanks very much for your time. Thank you, Philip. That was extremely fascinating and I think the quantity of evidence that's out there is extremely compelling and seemingly hard to ignore, definitely. Um, no, thank you. That was that was really incredible. Um, I think I learned a lot there and I think probably everyone else that's here did as well. Good. Um, just before we jump into the questions, which we've already had quite a few, so please keep sending them through. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that there is just a really short survey at the end of the webinar. So once you leave, it'll just quickly open up into your browser. Um, there's only a few questions. If um, anyone and everyone could please fill it out, that would be really, really helpful because we really appreciate all feedback. So please fill it out. <laughs> um, and yes, please send all your questions in. Um, there's no better time to do it than when you have a a specialist sitting here ready to answer all of your questions. So please send them in um, and don't be shy. Um, we'll start going through some of the questions uh, that we've got. So we've got one from Arabella that says, um, thank you for your important WA research showing increased flammability of forests that have been prescribed burnt. To what extent, if any, can we extrapolate these findings to other forest types in other states? I suppose the, the short answer is that I, out of the forests I've examined, I haven't yet found any exceptions, but it doesn't mean that there aren't. Um, it may be, for example, if you have a short enough forest that the, the plants can't grow to a point where they become overstory shelter. Um, we don't yet know if those those places exist. I, I still see even um, heathlands often developing into a much less flammable state. So, um, so at this stage, I actually think it's probably the safest thing is to assume that this is the case to start with, unless it's proven otherwise. Okay. Um, we also have um, just a quick book suggestion from Alison to anyone that's interested that says um, the book 
last of the nomads by wj peasley is well worth reading on desert burning if anyone's interested in that um rosemary's asked i hear about aboriginal burning to hill country what does this mean and is there any evidence of first nations people setting fire to forest if that's something you might know i i don't want to speak for uh too many um, Aboriginal people. A little bit of what I've been told, I suppose, is that um, is that there are areas where there traditionally had been a lot of very frequent burning. And again, we're talking about, um, say, along travel pathways, uh, around campsites, that sort of thing. So there'd been a historical uh, management in that way and what that's done is that it's maintained really small areas in that disclimax state um, and that's enabled certain plants or animals to to populate those areas if you then stop that um, it's the same as if you take out another part and another type of disturbance that has been in balance in a landscape you know like around here we have you know lyre birds come through and they'll scratch up the forest soil and they're disturbing it but they're disturbing only the area that they need. You take layer birds out, then that will change the ecology of that country. They are an integral part of that country. Disturbance isn't inherently bad, but there needs to, it needs to be in its right place. And First Nations had found a place for disturbance over 65,000 years of experimentation. So, so I think that's my understanding that, yes, sometimes there was um, forests burnt, but it tended to be um, very, very localised places around campsites, that sort of thing. So specifically burning in um, in very careful ways where, where people would say, I want to burn this, but I don't want it to burn or scorch that plant there. And, and that's the level of detail that they're talking about. Okay. Uh, we have another question uh, from Jackie that asked, where was the charcoal in the soils? Sorry, where was the charcoal in the soil study conducted, and how applicable to the rest of Australia do you think it is? So the Scott Mooney graph, the main graph that I was showing, um, that was the average of charcoal measurements taken right across the country. So that's um, it's it's still not enough measurements. There are big gaps in the knowledge across the country. Um, but that's that's the sum of the evidence that was around at the time of that. Okay. Uh, and Neil's asked, is there is the contention that the mountain ash and alpine ash is fire climax correct? And is sorry, and that is did they occur in pre-European times in single age strand, stands? And if so, what was the fire frequency? I am particularly interested in the ash forests east of Melbourne to the Omeo Hotham area. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the idea of a of a climax community is, you know, it's it's got it got a lot of holes in it, but I won't I won't go into that. We a lot of the time what we understand there is still just within a time frame that we've seen things may continue to to change over time. But certainly the first accounts, first European written accounts of those ash forests describe normal trees. They weren't single age. Um, they, they were always in, in the longest undisturbed forests. They, they, they don't have to be burnt down to restart again. That's a, a little bit of a, a myth that's been around for a while. Um, what will happen as a forest gets older, you'll get an individual tree that falls and gap regeneration happening in that patch there. So, so you may have the majority of trees as, you know, you know, hundred meter tall trees. Um, but amongst that, there will still be an ongoing, uh, recruitment. So there's still a mixture of ages through there. Um, I, from the best of my understanding, it's not that if it's left long enough, it will all turn to rainforest. Rainforest will only happen in those wet gullies and in specific areas there. So, so the best of 
of uh, the knowledge that I've seen is that those mountain ash will continue on that way. So it's 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 about the closest thing that we've got to uh, an understanding of a climax community, I suppose. Thank you. Uh, Tony has said an impressive set of evidence being presented here. Thanks for the fascinating discussion, Professor Zilstra. Um, and Matthew also said, wow, extremely compelling results. I think everyone can agree on that one. Um, Lynn said, to wildlife, a fire is still a fire. Many of our wildlife died during and after prescribed burns. Their food is burnt and their protective habitat is removed so they are vulnerable to predation. Um, Arabella yep. also said, extraordinary presentation. Thank you. Um, Jackie said, brilliant talk. Thank you so much. We will be hanging around for the story of the last slide. Uh, Rosemary said, wonderful <laughs> presentation. Thank you. Many thanks from Barry. Um, Del has said, thank you for your time sharing the serious harm of prescribed burns. Um, Clinton has asked or said, thank you for an amazing presentation. How do we change fire management policies and convince governments that are that our increasingly hostile climate is best managed by mature forests and woodlands? Yeah, I feel the answer is I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, I worked in an agency for a long time and I know that the people I was working with were aware of it um, um, and and very concerned. I know an enormous number of people who are aware of it and concerned who who are working in in a range of different agencies. Um, but it's one of those things where there is a, a popular understanding um, and an expectation. People want to feel that something's being done. and in Eastern Australia, after those black summer fires, um, it would have been a time when there needed to be some real soul searching because what had happened was those those fires followed the period of the most intensive period of prescribed burning in the history of national parks in New South Wales. They'd been they doubled the amount of prescribed burning compared to the decade before. And those fires just rolled right over the top of every prescribed burn. So the whole strategy did nothing whatsoever. There were, um, you know, we had we had body counts of people who had been killed by the smoke from prescribed burns. And then three years later, uh, these wildfires burnt straight over the top of those prescribed burns. And in some cases were more severe because of those prescribed burns. Um, that would have been the time that we needed to stop and look at that and say, okay, we need to change direction. But instead we got COVID and everybody had to stop talking about it. And now this, this September, I've got a weather station in Wollongong and in September it's recorded more days in the mid thirties than it did all of last summer. So people have been shocked by this heat wave. We've come out of, three years of cool weather following those fires now there's heat waves and it looks like a bad summer on the way and people are terrified and it's 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 like crying out for blood it's like a mob with torches ready to go and set fire to everything because people are just afraid and in the forest is now being scapegoated and we are you know war on wild places now I think, yeah, I hope it doesn't, you know, take anything so severe like the body count or previously and people can come to the realisation without it being such a severe event, uh, pretty much inciting change. Um, Brett's asked, how critical is fire seasonality to the use of fire for conservation purposes? Um. Yeah, it's it's really important. Um, I I haven't gone into that um, in this talk, but I know um, there's been quite a lot of work that's come out of 
Kings Park. Um, there, Kingsley Dixon sort of really kicked a lot of that off, but it's still continuing now. Um, people like um, Russell Miller and Ryan Tangney leading that work there, showing that, you know, for example, there are plants that if you uh, if you have a natural fire regime where they're burnt in, say, late summer, um, those plants will germinate and they've got a cool season ahead of them to establish as seedlings. If instead you burn them in the spring, um, you'll germinate them, but you don't have that that cool wet winter for them to establish. They go straight into a hot, dry summer, and you lose that whole batch of of seedlings. And so you you can lose species that way by by burning out of season. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Sean. Um, who says, according to some papers I've read before, there are many plants like banksias require a periodic fire to disperse seed and for some other plant species, seed to germinate. If we keep the fire out the out of the forest, then what will happen to the those fire-dependent plants? I think quite a common question that most yeah. people have, actually. It's a good question. It is. It is. And I suppose the the we can't keep fire out of the forest. We can reduce the amount of it. What we're, what our forests are suffering from is not a lack of fire. We, um, I, I was working on the um, national document of, of fire as a key threatening, key threatening process. And by far, the main factor affecting species disappearing is too much fire, too frequent fire. There were a tiny number of species that would benefit from more fire, but it wasn't that lack of fire had caused them to disappear. It was that they'd nearly been entirely wiped out through land clearing and that sort of thing. And that fire could be used as a, as a remedy to try and rescue them to, to stimulate uh, regeneration. But um we we have an issue of too much fire. If we if we stop burning them, and if we aggressively try to fight fires and and catch them while they're small, we will still not eliminate fire. We will reduce it. But we have climate change to contend with now. We're never going to get rid of fire, um, and and we shouldn't. It is it is a natural part of the landscape. So. If we look at um, a, a pre-European system where we didn't have people burning vast landscapes, uh, where fire was all focused in those little areas, um, then what you would have had, and, and again, going back even further, before our First Nations were here, you know, we've got quite a few million years between Gondwana and when the First Nations turned up, and there was nobody lighting fires during that time, and what we had were fire sensitive species thriving there. We had we would have had a landscape that was dominated by old growth, less flammable um, forest with little points where lightning had started fires and those fires had self extinguished because the landscape was less flammable. So you've still got a mixture of ages, a mosaic of ages. It's just that the mosaic is flipped from what it is now. At the moment, it's dominated by young flammable regrowth with tiny remnants of refugia in uh, before we turned up it was dominated by old forests with tiny remnants with tiny tiny patches of of young disturbed forest okay um we have another good question from rowan that says um thank you very much philip how did people develop the intervals of prescribed burning some people will say burn every 10 years or 15 years how can we approach authorities that have this in their plans yeah so um so in southwest australia um parks their dvca have an approach where they want um, 45% of the tenure burnt within the last six years. Um, and so the argument is that that came up from research showing that um, uh, that's how long prescribed burning was effective for. Problem is it was policy for decades before that paper was published. So the, the 
the, the paper kind of is now being used, there is some evidence that for that first six, after six years, the forest is much, much more flammable. Um, when you're burning on a, say, a, a 10 or 15 year cycle, what you're doing is you are stimulating that regrowth. Then you're going past that initial period where fire might be, um, where, where, where you've effectively cleared the forest understory by burning it. That really, um, you know, six years is a really outside range for that. I think really you'd only get benefit for a couple of years in most instances. There's a lot of examples of of forests reburning, um, you know, a couple of years after a previous burn and reburning quite severely. Um, so if you wanted to use prescribed burning to actually make a forest less flammable, the only way to do it is in a way where you are deliberately trying to clear plants with it, where you're trying to maintain a clear area. If you're saying that the, the reason people come up with numbers like 10 or 15 years between fires is that they're trying to compromise. Because if you burn really frequently, you will lose species. You, um, you know, we've, we know quite well that we're going to wipe species out by doing that. And so there's seen as a compromised position that you burn 10 or 15 years apart and then you allow those species to persist. Problem is that you're letting those forests get into their most flammable stage and then you're reburning them right at the point when they're hardest to burn. So how do we approach authorities? Um, again, I'd just try try talking it through with them, try and get as well informed as you can on this and come to them with evidence, let them know that people are aware and concerned. And um, that's that's my best guess. I, I haven't yet seen any killer argument that makes anybody change their mind. Most of the time, managers, regional managers, whether they agree or not, they can't actually change the system because there is a hectare target given to them um, by a politician somewhere quite high up the chain. Okay, um, we are very quickly running out of time. Um, so we still have three questions left. Um, Philip, if you're happy to answer those. I'll try. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll, um, we'll get through the last three questions and then we'll um, have to wrap it up for this evening or today. Um, so I'll just, well, yeah, we'll go through these. Uh, Jeremy says, hi, Phil, thank you for your presentation. Seeing as though many areas of the Jarra forest have been heavily harvested for timber in the past, they are today characterised in many instances as being dominated by young regrowth and stump coppice regrowth, which you say is flammable and is what is keeping the forest in a highly flammable state. Could ecological thinning be a way to, as you say, get the forest to mature while also reducing the flammability? Ecological thinning being the removal of younger trees so as to retain the taller trees and trees with better growth potential so that they grow quicker and can form a canopy. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, thinning happens naturally in a forest. But the way it happens there is um, is through limitations of resources. And so you're effectively you're starving out weaker stems. Those stems will naturally thin. If you go in and manually thin them at the moment, what you'll do, it, even if you're cutting out the material that you've cut, if you if you cut it and leave it on the ground, then you then you leave material there ready to burn. So you've got an issue there straight away. Um, but you're also opening up that canopy by removing those stems. Even if it's only a smaller amount, you're letting more light in to dry the litter on the ground so that fire can burn on more days, and you're letting more wind in because you're removing some of that overstory shelter. And you're also creating a vacancy again because there's now less tall biomass using the resources. So if you look at Specht's principle again, you've taken out that 
um, taller biomass and it will be replaced by lower biomass, which will be there available as fuel. And so this is what we see is empirically when we look at thinned forests consistently, they burn with higher severity and are more likely to burn than forests that haven't been thinned. So I think tacking the word ecological onto the front of thinning is is a little bit of greenwashing, really, in my opinion. <laughs> um, thank you. So um, we've got a question from, I think it's Noni. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, who says, excellent presentation. Could something be done, be a biological procedure rather than burning? For example, inoculation of degraded forests with soil, biota, fungi, et cetera, that assist with converting fuel to soil. Um, yeah, so there there are a number of biological um, things that that can be done. Mostly, it's to do with um, I think removing feral animals that are say preying on um, a lot of the small mammals. Just to I'll try and be be brief with this. Um, our, our plants tend to rely very heavily on mycorrhizal fungi that uh, are feeding them. So you've got about 10 species of mycorrhizae for every native plant. Um, when a fire comes through, it kills off a lot of those mycorrhizae that are close to the surface and leaves a small number of, of them behind. Um, small mycophagus marsupials, bandicoots and things like that will come through. They'll go into the little refugia where the fire sensitive mycorrhizae are still living. They'll eat the sporocups, the um, you know the truffles from those fungi, and they'll go and do that out across the landscape and redistribute it back through there. And when you've got that healthy suite of mycorrhizae, the plants grow faster and more healthy and have higher moisture content. And um, and so you get a less flammable forest quicker. So so there are measures that we can make just by um, undoing some of the damage that we've done, I suppose. Um, feral animal control and reintroduction of missing species. Um, and the other thing is to is to recognise that we have made a more flammable landscape around the area. And so we need to balance that out by uh, more rapid fire suppression. Perfect. Um, and our last question for the night, <laughs> I promise. Um, mm -hmm. Nicole has said, thanks for the informative presentation. Is there a definitive paper to reduce arguing against prescribed burns on wooded forests on lots less than five hectares with a vulnerable land use such as a school? Um, it's fairly specific, I suppose. I, I can't think of a, a study that specifically looks at that. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of a lot of papers together that would make the case, you know, particularly around a school, um, smoke has huge impacts on health. Um, we know that it um, it's not just uncomfortable, it actually kills people. More people die from smoke in WA than they do from bushfires. And I mean smoke from prescribed burns. Um, so we know that's an issue. Um, it's much safer to, if if you do need to modify a forest around a school or something like that, to actually do it with mechanical um, techniques. Um, but as far as a definitive paper, I can't I can't think of anything to suggest. I'm sorry. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you everyone for attending tonight's webinar um, from wherever everyone's joining from and for sending in such fantastic questions. Um, and of course, thank you, Philip, for joining us, especially with the big time zone difference between WA and New South Wales, you must be pretty tired. <laughs> um, and of course, yeah, staying on a little bit later to answer everyone's uh, questions. It's really appreciated. It was a fantastic presentation. And I think, um, yeah, I think everyone, including me, really, really enjoyed it. It was really fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to everyone as well, um, our next 
webinar in October is with guest speaker Nancy Skade. So please keep an eye out on the Society's website and Facebook page. If you would like to be notified about our webinar events as well, please make sure you tick the box and put your email in uh, after the meeting in the survey. Um, and then we can make sure you everyone stays up to date. Um, but yes, thank you everyone for coming and thanks Philip, especially because we ran a little bit over time, but I think it was all worth it and everyone <laughs> definitely got some good information out of it, I think. So thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have no a worries. good night, everyone. Yeah, <laughs> thank you.